Videotape to film transfer made by WTTW Recording Services, Chicago. Welcome to another edition of Midwest Farm Report, presented by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area. I'm Vince Stotts, Farm Director of television station WLUK-TV in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And today we have an interesting program for you. It comes in two parts today. First, uh, an interview I had with Mr. Ted Borsma, who is Secretary of the Dairy Farmers Guild of America, in the New England states. Mr. Borsma was on a speaking tour in Wisconsin early in 1964 when I talked to him about the dairy industry in general and his feelings about the National Farmers Organization. Uh, with us today on the program is a man who just got in from out east from New Jersey. To be specific, he's Ted Borsma, born in the Netherlands on a dairy farm uh, and, of course, uh, has been in the United States for many years. Uh, uh, Ted, what's the weather like out in New Jersey right now? Pretty rough. How much snow did you have? Well, I would think about 18 inches on my place. Had a rough time getting to the airport, did you, to, uh, Definitely, uh, to yes, make it? Definitely, yes. Uh, golly, it's quite a storm that you had out there. Where's your farm located now? Glenwood, New Jersey. Glenwood, New Jersey. What uh, part of New Jersey and is that? That's in the northern part, in Sussex County. How far are you from New York? Uh, we're about 35, 40 miles from New York. Uh, a little bit about your uh, farming operation, Ted. Uh, what's, uh, what kind of a farm do you have? I have uh, uh, dairy. Uh, how many cows do you... Uh, I keep between 80 and 100 cows, and I milk around 74. And uh, what breed are they? Holstein. Registered or grade? Uh, no, uh, grades. Grade, grade grades, Holstein. Yes, yes. Uh, what kind of production do you get out of these Holsteins every well, year? Well, uh, mine production uh, average is between 850,000 and 2 million pounds a year. Well, that's uh, quite a bit of milk. You, we were mentioning just before uh, uh, how much of the uh, milk that's used in New Jersey is produced in New Jersey. What's the figure on that? And that's 35 percent right now. Of the milk that... That's, uh, all that we're, that's all we're producing in New Jersey right now. Oh, boy. 35 percent. Uh, how many farmers left in New Jersey? Not many. There's uh, between the 2,200 and 2,500, something like that. I'm, I haven't got the exact figure yeah. with me, but it's no more than 2,500. I think it's about 2,300. The number of farmers is really going down. That, well, we can't stand the pressure anymore. The taxes are too high. Uh, well, Ted, now, what is the current situation uh, among dairy farmers in New Jersey? Well, the current situation for the farmers in New Jersey is bad. We, uh, we're in a price squeeze, and uh, if, if the conditions keep on going for the next two, two or three years, I think we'll all be out of business there. Uh, how much are you getting for 100 pounds of milk? Well, our blend price last year was 435. Plus, we have a uh, small uh, uh, differential in uh, in uh, freight. Uh, then these uh, things we hear about six dollar milk out east are a little misleading, huh? They certainly are. How about feed costs and production costs out there? Uh, we we figured out our production cost. What we have in our office, we figure it's between the six dollars and eighty two. Seven uh, between the six dollar and eighty seven dollars right now. You're losing money. Uh, We're losing money. That's right, produce. surely. That's an amazing situation. And uh, we, I also want to say this: we have, and in, we're involved in a business like ours, thousands and thousands of dollars. And what I mean, uh, it's really a shame that we have to uh, lose money. What I mean, on that much money, any businessman, they work on a profit, but we're, low, we're really going at a loss, let me tell you. Well, now, Ted, you are a secretary of the Dairy Farmers Guild. Can yes. you tell us uh, what this is? Well, the Dairy Farmers Guild has been always a, a, a bargaining uh, organization for the farmers. We've always uh, uh, had the same idea as the NFO. Uh, we wanted uh, cost of production plus a reasonable profit on our product. And I think that's not too much to ask. Now, uh, you mentioned the NFO. Uh, my next question to you was going to be, what is the attitude of the Dairy Farmers Guild toward NFO? Well, I'll tell you. Our uh, attitude it is. We went to Syracuse to, see, uh, to hear Orville Freeman speak. Mm -hmm. And there, Orville Freeman spoke to us that the only thing that's ever going to lick this situation is 
that uh, we had to get ourselves in a large organization. And uh, we were, uh, well, I can't say this from my own point, but they, our, pen, our southern uh, New Jersey group went to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and uh, he told them there that, uh, or he gave them a hint that the NFO was the only organization, really, that was going. Um, are you currently urging your members to join the uh, National well, We Congress certainly are. In fact, our members uh, want to go along, too. And, I mean, they're signing up contracts right along now. Uh, how large a group is the Dairy Farmers Guild? But, uh, Dairy Farmers Guild uh, was, at, at its strongest, was 3,500. And uh, right now, I couldn't tell you the exact numbers, but I mean, I'd have to, uh, I'd have to look over the records. Uh, what, uh, what area does the uh, Dairy uh, Farmers Guild It's Tri-State tri Marist, state. yeah. We have, uh, we have contacts and uh, units in all three states. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, now, Ted, I imagine uh, a fellow like you, uh, who is aware of the situation in the dairy industry, has some ideas, uh, things that can be done to help the dairy farmers in New Jersey as well as in Wisconsin. What are your ideas on this? Well, my idea is that we, fa we farmers should act like businessmen, mm -hmm. and we should bargain for a price. We're the only segment in the United States that, ha uh, that have uh, not got a price on their product when we delivered. We don't know from one month we're getting to the other. But I mean, uh, I don't know exactly what I'm going to get for my milk next month. Now, we're, mm -hmm. we're the only organization. Only business people that that do that. What well, I mean, everybody else gets their price that they ask for. And uh, what do you think is going to be the thing that you can do to get uh, this price? The only thing that I can do is to bargain at get a seat at the bargaining table and bargain for a price. And I think that we should be sure to bargain no less than cost of production plus a reasonable return. Now, Ted, you're going to be in uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota in the uh, Midwest for a few days, aren't you? Yes. Uh, there are some meetings that uh, you're going to be speaking at in the near future. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, tonight, uh, you're going to be at Wausau at Newman High School from uh, 6 to 10 p.m. I suppose you're looking forward to seeing a lot of farmers from the area out there. I certainly do. And uh, Thursday, January 16th from uh, 6 to 10 p.m. at Menominee Junior High School. Uh, in Menominee, Wisconsin, Friday, January 17th, from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the uh, National Guard Armory in Tracy, Minnesota, and Saturday, January 18th at 8 p.m. at Edison High School in Appleton. So this coming Saturday, you're going to be uh, right here in our immediate area again, uh, 8 p.m. Edison High School at Appleton. Um, uh, what are you going to be telling the farmers uh, at these meetings, Ted? I'm going, to tell, <coughs> I'm going to tell the farmers exactly what I've been telling you, that it's not only their fight, but it's our fight. We are in the same situation and they are in the same price squeeze, and the only thing that we have to get a price is to fight for it. But remember this, it's not, it's not the co-ops or any other job, but it's the farmers. The farmer has to do the job himself. That's one thing the farmers got to learn. They've got to get the price for themselves. Nobody else is going to give it to them. Okay. Thank you very much, Ted, for being with us today. Uh, uh, you came to the uh, United States how many years ago, Ted? Oh, when you were just a small 30, fellow? 34 years ago. Do you uh, have any uh, remembrances of uh, what uh, farming was like in the Netherlands? Well, I was, I was back in uh, the Netherlands uh, seven years ago. My oh. wife and I, we went through Holland, Germany, and Switzerland. And let me tell you, we're way behind times as far as farming is concerned, as far as organization is concerned. Them farmers in Europe are organized. They are. And if we, we, we keep on the same basis that we are now, they're going to take away a lot of our markets through the common market. I really believe That's it. That's a very, very interesting statement. I'm glad I asked the question. <laughs> well, we have farmers in Holland that uh, have been promised, and uh, my dad was back this spring mm -hmm. to Holland, and uh, they're getting 29 cents for a quart of milk right now. The farmer is the getting farmer 29 is, cents? Yes. The farmer is what does it that. work out to we get here? Uh, <laughs> seven cents, six cents, uh, somewhere, somewhere uh, six, along. seven, eight yes. cents a quart, and yeah. then there they're getting 29, 29 cents a quart. Cents. And that is organization. But I mean, them farmers, at one time they were the same with us. But now they have got the power. What I mean, they get a fair return for what they work for. But I mean, they haven't got their wives working in the barn like we have. 
let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I got, think uh, mother helps quite a bit in the farm uh, in this country. Too much. What I mean, a mother and the children both. What I mean, you you put your you put the children in the city to work, mm -hmm. like we put our children on a farm to work. Mm -hmm. They put us behind bars, but I guess our children don't count. <laughs> <laughs> so the farmers of America better uh, get on the ball, huh? I think so. I really okay. do. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ted, for being with us. It's been a very interesting discussion, and I hope your stay in uh, Wisconsin is a pleasant one. I think it will be. The next portion of Midwest Farm Report today is a brief address by Wisconsin's senior senator, William Proxmire, discussing the farm problem and the National Farmers Organization. But before we see this uh, presentation by Senator Proxmire, I'd like to read to you from the congressional record uh, so we can get an idea of uh, some of Senator Proxmire's feelings about the National Farmers Organization. He made a tour, a speaking tour, of Wisconsin recently, making, oh, somewhere between 20 and 30 speeches in a very short time, covering the entire state of Wisconsin. And uh, he, of course, met many NFO members during this time, and this is what he uh, told the Senate about his meetings. I quote uh, the senator, throughout my meetings, the one organization most likely to provoke spontaneous applause and approval was the NFO. Farmers are shrewd and realistic. They know there are serious technological difficulties in the way of farm organization for collective bargaining to secure higher prices. For example, milk, our great Wisconsin product, is perishable. Cows dry up promptly if they're not milked regularly. The ultimate weapon of the NFO, if called for, uh, withholding of milk, has serious public interest and health implications. And would dairy farmers surrender their prized individuality, submerge their independence enough to organize into an effective group? Well, many farmers seriously question this. Our farmers are noted for their individuality and their self-reliance, and for their pride in their individuality and self-reliance. But in spite of these serious handicaps, the NFO is making progress, Senator Proxmire says. Farmers are pay paying that tough to part with $25 to join. Now, to a Wisconsin farmer these days, $25 is a great deal of money. Uh, that is what it costs to join this collective bargaining or organization. In my state, the organization has doubled in size the past year, and the farmer is really becoming desperate. Here is some feeling as expressed by a farmer in one town hall on Senator Proxmire's tour. I hope any farm legislation increasing farm income fails. I want to see this situation get so bad and farmers get such a belly full of low prices and high costs that they will join the NFO because it's the only possible hope. Then we'll be able to make some progress and only then. This is no rare or eccentric view, the senator says. Many farmers share it. Now, here are Senator William Proxmire's views on the National Farmers Organization. The NFO, the National Farm Organization, is devoted to the objectives, the purposes, which I think all thoughtful Americans would share for agriculture. What the NFO wants to do, and what I think all of us would agree is right, is to try and increase farm income. Everybody who knows anything about farm income knows that it's much too low, and would also uh, try to do this by helping to get the government out of agriculture so the taxpayer wouldn't have the very heavy burden that he has in agriculture. The fact is that because of the uh, Russian wheat deal and other arrangements, it's possible that the cost of the agricultural program will be less in the coming year than expected. It will still, however, exceed seven billion dollars. Unfortunately, not enough people, including farmers, realize and appreciate how low, and I think how shamefully low, farm income is. The fact is, for example, that uh, the income that people can receive by working in a factory, working in a store, working in almost any line of endeavor that you can, that you can think of, is a great deal higher than working on a farm, although working on a farm takes uh, skill, it takes investment, it takes knowledge, 
and it takes, as everybody knows, a lot of very hard work. For example, the fact is, according to the statistics of the Department of Agriculture, that income in Wisconsin by Wisconsin dairy farmers last year was less than 50 cents per hour. That is, for the hours worked. And this allows a modest 5% return on invested capital, which is a much smaller return than manufacturers and other business people would get and would expect to get. This is in spite of the fact that the farmer works longer hours, and particularly the dairy farmer in Wisconsin works longer hours by far than people off the farm do. Department of Agriculture showed that last June, the average Wisconsin dairy farmer worked 11 and a half hours a day. And this isn't five day week. Not on a dairy farm, it's a seven day week. The cows have to be milked every day and twice a day. And of course, the chores have to be done and all the other work on the farm has to be done. This is also true, although the farmer's investment has increased very, very sharply. And today, the average farm in Wisconsin has an investment of $35,000 to $40,000. A farmer is not a man like uh, many workers who goes to work and, uh, and offers simply his own skill. That kind of man deserves to be rewarded. But certainly a man who invests heavily, as the farmer does, thirty-five, forty, dollars in some cases fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, deserves a, a far better opportunity than the, than the farmer in Wisconsin has. Now, it's one thing if you could say, well, the reason that, that uh, income is so low is there are a lot of marginal farmers. The fact is the marginal farmers has been eliminated for a long time. This income has been so low for so long and so many farmers have left the farm. The marginal farmer, the so-called marginal farmer, has disappeared. These are farmers who are successful farmers, operating far bigger farms than, than their fathers did and that their, their, their older brothers did a few years ago. It's also true, of course, in America that we not only expect people to work hard and to make an investment if they're going to get any kind of an income, but also to take a risk. That's part of the, what you have to contribute or what you have to sacrifice, chance you have to take if you expect to get a substantial income in this country. A risk. Well, does the farmer take a risk? Does anybody take a risk nearly as big as the farmer does? If the farmer finds that one of his cows has tuberculosis, brucellosis, if the farmer, um, of course, he's ruined. If the uh, uh, farmer has a bad crop year, he can be destroyed. Even something that is so completely out of uh, the farmer's control as nuclear fallout can be devastating to farmers. And of course, price fluctuations uh, are um, a way of life for farmers. In addition to all this, however, we require people not only to work hard and to make an investment and take a risk, but also to be efficient, to be efficient if they expect to get an improvement in income. Well, the facts show that the farmers in this country have enjoyed the greatest improvement in efficiency and productivity of any group in America. The fact is that uh, people off the farm increase their efficiency every year in this country by Oh, something like two and a half percent. In other words, over a period of 10 years, their efficiency might be increased by one fourth, by 25 percent. Farmers in the last 10 years have doubled, have doubled their, their output, their efficiency. In other words, uh, today, one farmer can produce what it took two farmers to produce 10 short years ago. Now, the farmer ought to be getting twice the income, but he's not. He's not getting twice the income. He's getting less than he got 10 years ago, and much less. 10 years ago, as a matter of fact, 1953 was a good year for dairy farmers and for other farmers. But in spite of the fact the farmer has a bigger investment, that he's working very hard, he's taking a big risk, that he has never been so efficient, he's far more efficient than other people are in our country, and far more productive, and of course, he's the most productive farmer in the world, he still isn't getting the kind of income that he needs. Now, in addition to all this, these are reasons, of course, why we need something like the National Farm Organization, why we need farmers to get together to try and work to get the kind of organization, the kind of unity that will enable them to get a return for their income, or rather for their effort, a return to increase their income. In addition to the fact that income is low and the farmer deserves more, 
you have to recognize that the farmer is getting a lesser and lesser share of the housewife's food dollar. Just the other day it was reported that in the, uh, the most recent quarter for which figures are available, a farmer received something like 37 cents of the housewife's food dollar. And this is true although the farmer puts in the lion's share of the investment, does most of the work, takes the risk, and has developed this big skill. He still only gets 37 cents of the housewife's food dollar. Now this is shamefully low. And of course, if the farmer were better organized, if you were unified, he would be in a position to see that he got a better share of that housewife's food dollar. Now we've investigated this. I can recall when I was a member of the state assembly in uh, Madison uh, many years ago, we uh, introduced a resolution and got it through and investigated the profits of the processors. Those profits are high and the wages are high. But I think most realistic farmers know that they aren't going to get uh, uh, any better shake, any better break, any better income by knocking down the processor or, or uh, there's much hope of getting those wages down or those profits down. Uh, he can't do it and I'm not sure it would be good policy uh, to uh, do this kind of thing. These processors are at least in some competition and by and large the farmer is going to be better off. He will do better if other people in the food industry also uh, gain. What the farmer needs is to, is to get the kind of power that industry has. Industry has been organized for a long, long time. Just the other day, steel announced an increase in prices, although they're operating far below capacity. How can they do it? They can do it because they organize together and work together. The fact is that the uh, working people have increased their income by organizing. Back around the turn of the century, steel workers worked something like 84 hours a week, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And on the seventh day, when the shift changed, they'd have to work 24 hours a day. And they'd make something like 10, 15, 20, 25 cents an hour. Well, today, as is well known, they make $2.50. Why? Because they're organized, because they're organized, and because they work together. This is true of the professions. Fact is that the lawyers and the doctors and the dentists and the other professional people, the accountants and so forth, have substantial incomes. Now it's true that they require a great deal of training, but to be a good farmer these days takes a great deal of training and experience too. The reason these people get more is because they are more or less one way or another organized and they're organized in such a way that they see that their fees are, are adequate. This country has believed that the individual should help himself and that it's up to the individual to make progress. We have a prejudice against having too much government and that's a healthy prejudice. But I think we should also recognize, however, that from a realistic standpoint, is whether, although we don't say this very often publicly, we also believe that the individual group should help itself. Whether this individual group are workers, are business people, or are farmers. The farmers just haven't done it. The farmers haven't had organizations that are designed to get together to get a better price. You have some very fine and good and decent organizations that contribute greatly to the farmer and for farmers in various ways. But until the NFO came along, there was no national organization that was really intent on seeing that the farmer, through his own effort, his own economic effort, without the help of the government, got the kind of income that he ought to get. The objective of getting the government out of farming is a very good, healthy objective, and I'm sure that I can tell you, as a member of the United States Senate, it would be very welcomed by uh, 99 other members of the Senate. It was the biggest headache we have is how to handle this farm problem. We recognize, most of us do, the inequity of the farmer. We also recognize the very heavy burden on the taxpayer. And we would like to do what we can to, to solve this realistically. We'd like to establish a basis for agreeing on a fair share of the housewife's dollar. But you can't do it when the farmer is disorganized and the food processors and the labor unions and the others who handle the food after it leaves the farm are organized. The organized groups, because they are, are organized, get the lion's share of the dollar and get more and more. And the farmer gets less and less. The only way to solve that is to see that all groups are organized. And one group, of course, that isn't organized is the American farmer. The NFO's operations 
would give the American farmer a, a reward commensurate with his efficiency, with his hard work, with his investment. And I think that one of the most persuasive arguments is that the alternative for the NFO is years and years of uh, continued depressed income with more small farms, family farms disappearing, and the big farms, which actually aren't as efficient, but do have the power of capital, and do have the power eventually of getting organized in that way, succeeding. And when we have this kind of corporate collectivized agriculture, I think it's going to be just as inefficient as Russian agriculture is. Because you don't have the basic incentive for the primary producer, the individual farmer, doesn't own his farm. And I think that we have an investment in the well-being of our nation, in our uh, individual family farms that we should preserve in every way we can. And the best way to preserve it is to do all we can to encourage the individual farmer to organize and to join a group like the NFO and to work with the NFO. I think we ought to stress, however, that this must be a conservative revolution. After all, its roots are conservative. He wants to conserve the family farm. He wants to conserve the individual farmer working to negotiate uh, with other economic forces and to leave the government out of it as much as possible. And this is why I want to conclude by stressing that it should be orderly. It should be responsible. It should respect the rights of others. And it should not resort to violence or intimidation under any circumstances. This is a very tough thing to ask farmers to do because so very much is at stake. And under these circumstances, when the NFO does take action, there is temptation at times to be uh, rough and tough with those who don't cooperate. This is something, that if the NFO is going to succeed, if it's going to get the sympathy and public support it has to have, it must exercise restraint. This is the one way that the NFO can command the kind of following that it deserves and that its objectives certainly merit. This is your Senator Bill Proxmire reporting you from Washington. Thank you very much for listening and wishing you good health. We hope that this edition of Midwest Farm Report has been of interest to you. Today we featured Mr. Ted Borsma, who is secretary of the Dairy Farmers Guild of America in the New England states, and also a presentation by Wisconsin senior senator William Proxmire with his views on the National Farmers Organization. We hope that you will tune in to the next edition of Midwest Farm Report on this station.